Hello and welcome to a special episode of To The Point. In six days time on Thursday, India will mark the 40th anniversary of the emergency. It is undoubtedly the most traumatic experience in independent India's history. But today, 40 years later, the majority of the country wasn't even born at the time and few people recall just how horrible an experience it was. My guest today is someone who lived through the emergency. He's one of India's most highly regarded politicians, former Deputy Prime Minister Lal Krishna Dhwani. Mr. Dhwani, in the diary you kept at the time, your entry for the 26th of June 1975 read, June 26, 1975 may well prove to be the last day in the history of Indian democracy as we have understood it. Forty years later, the majority of India today wasn't even born at the time. They have no idea how traumatic that experience was. How would you explain and describe to them the emergency? I have compared that period with the period under the British rule when uh, civil liberties were suppressed and several such, such draconian laws were passed. And I have found at least one book which says that uh, what happened during the British rule was the biggest crime a government could commit in a dem in, under a civilized society. And Indira Gandhi equaled that crime with the emergency? Yes, no, I would say that what Indira Gandhi did was worse even than that. Why? Here is with me the Shah Commission report. And this Shah Commission report is a report that was uh, the Chief Justice at that time, Chief Justice Shah. He prepared it. And this commission disappeared report it says to inquire into the excesses and malpractices committed under the 1975-77 internal emergency the Janata government appointed in May 1977 the commission of inquiry under Justice J.C. Shah former Chief Justice of India the commission submitted its report by August 78 however on return to power in January 1980 Indira Gandhi arranged seizure of all copies of the Shah Commission report and destroyed them. Because she didn't want any record kept of exactly it, what had happened. It but created an impression that not a single copy of the report exists in India as per the following assertive statements in the websites, journals and books. Now in fact the cold facts of the emergency are truly chilling. 34,988 people were arrested under the Maintenance of Internal Security Act, 75,818 under the Defense of India rules. Practically the entire opposition was jailed. Yourself, Lal, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Chandrasekhar, Jayaprakash Narayan, Muraji Desai. The press was censored. The constitution was brutally amended and even the judiciary came to accept that the right to life no longer existed. What were those 21 months like? They were horrible in this sense that, uh, for example, myself, my leader Vajpayee and several others, we were in members of parliament who went to Bangalore for a parliamentary committee meeting. And uh, we, were, we were told that uh, uh, you are to stay in this hostel and uh, you are not to go here, here and there. And on the 26th morning, morning you were arrested? I was arrested. In fact, we came to know even from Delhi, our own colleagues told us that Jai Prakash Ji has been arrested, Uraji Bhai has been arrested, so and so has been arrested, and we are sure that they will also be coming to you to arrest you. Did you have any inclination before the emergency was announced that events were moving in a direction where civil liberties would be suspended, where the opposition would be arrested, where censorship would be imposed on the press? No, not at all. I want to come, Mr. Dhani, to the interview you gave the Indian Express on Thursday. You said in that interview, at present, the forces that can crush democracy are stronger. I don't think anything has been done that gives me the assurance that civil liberties will not be suspended or destroyed again. And you added, not at all. Why do you believe the forces that can crush democracy 
are stronger today? A stronger is a word. I do not know whether I used stronger. I simply said strong. But I did feel, and I said it to the correspondent also who was interviewing me. I said what surprises me and what distresses me is that those who have imposed such a drastic emergency on the country do not seem to have any sense of guilt for that. It is this that uh, distresses me and makes me feel that if uh, people can do all this, we are going to, uh, to, to Bangalore for a parliamentary committee meeting and they propose to arrest us there. Uh, they can do anything. So you were suggesting in fact that there is no sense of atonement either on the part of the Congress party or the Gandhi family for the emergency and no assurance from them this won't happen again. That's right. And therefore it is that I said it in my, in my interview to the Indian Express also that it is because even after that, even after all these arrests, Jay Prakash being arrested, there is no, no sense of guilt. Nowhere in the Congress party, nowhere in parliament. And it is this that uh, makes me worry. Would you have expected a formal public apology from the Congress party for the emergency? I would certainly have expected. I would, uh, these days, someone asked me, what about uh, the 6th December, what happened in Ayodhya, etc. I said, I, I wrote immediately after that, I was in jail at that time. And I did write a letter to the, uh, to, to, the to some paper, expressing regrets. You said it was the worst day of your life. Huh? And you expected Indira Gandhi and the Gandhi family to do to something, say something similar. something similar. Huh? Indira Gandhi did, after she lost the elections, resign. She did accept responsibility. You think that was a sufficient? I don't think. I don't know, really. I don't recall. But I, do not, I have not seen any sense of guilt weighing on them that it not happen. So, in a sense, there is a moral responsibility on Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi as her descendants to A, express that guilt and B, give an assurance it will never happen again. That's right. In fact, I have read out to you this particular Shah Commission report which was crea created at that time and all these copies how they were buried. Absolutely. And now you are saying that today Sonia Gandhi as the descendant of Indira Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi as the grandson owe a duty to publicly apologize for the emergency. That's right. You know when you said that the forces that can crush democracy are stronger did you have individuals or institutions in mind? Not individuals, but uh, because uh, subsequently what I have seen is there has been a tendency to shift the blame from Indira Gandhi to someone else. So and so advised her. She did not quite understand the implications of uh, emergency. All these things have been said by eminent people. But I do not subscribe to that view at all. That is an attempt to exonerate her and that's you're saying right. that's rubbish. I wouldn't use such harsh words. But that suit, suit uh, Karan Thapar very, very well. But so far as I'm concerned, I would think that uh, there is no sense of responsibility for all that happened. And that does descend on Sonia yes. and Rahul as well. Yes. There's something else in your Indian Express interview that I found intriguing. You said, from what I can see, the number of people in this generation who are committed to democracy and civil liberties is going down. And then you added, I do not say that the political leadership is not mature, but kamiyo ke karan vishwas nahi hota. Can you expand a little on that for me? My own feeling is that in the British days when anything of this kind happened there were reactions particularly when a person like uh, uh, like say Jay Prakash Narayan or Muraji Bhai he is arrested and put in prison there used to be reactions from the uh, senior members of society and from senior members of parliament. Nothing happened in 75? Nothing, nothing happened in 75. 
Nothing, absolutely. Why did India give in so easily? Was it because they were taken by surprise? Or it, was it because they lacked the moral fiber as a nation? It is therefore that I had made that observation during that period that uh, in so far as the media is concerned, I said it to a gathering of media persons, I said, uh, I feel sad that uh, when uh, the government expected you only to bend, you were willing to crawl. The media let the country down in 75? Of the various sections, if I were to identify the politicians, members of parliament, judiciary, media, I would think that uh, I said I am a person who is simultaneously a, par a parliamentarian as well as a media person, as also a person who has been in public life for all these years. And so I feel that uh, I feel very saddened by the response of the media particularly, also of the, my colleagues in parliament. Could an emergency happen again today? Therefore it is that I said it. That because there is no sense of guilt, there is no sense of apology. Therefore it is that I, I feel worried. You really feel worried? Yes, I do feel worried. You genuinely feel that an emergency can happen 40 years later the second time? No, it cannot happen easily a second time because after the successful democracy that we have had for all these years, Despite the cynicism in the beginning, when parliamentary democracy was adopted by our constitution makers, and most of the uh, Englishmen also said, hogi. We have had a successful democracy. And yet an emergency happened in 75? Yes. And you feel you can't rule out the possibility it could happen again? Again. Do we have enough constitutional safeguards in our system? Or it is that not lacking? constitutional safeguards which are uh, wanting as much as the political will of those who are in authority. That political will has question marks over it? Still. And that is the cause of worry? That's right. Would you say that is a cause of worry across the political spectrum? Broadly, yes. But those who have power, their uh, susceptibility will be always greater. Those who have power or those who are likely to come to power. Because power can corrupt? Yes. I want to talk about two institutions. First the judiciary, then the media. In 1975, even the Supreme Court buckled and accepted that the right to life no longer exists. It's been suspended. Today, do you think we have judges that would act as a bulwark in support of our liberties, would they stand up and defend liberties or would they capsize again? No, it was that time what was said about the right to life was a, was a, was a remark, observation made by one judge uh, who did not earn any respect because of that. And it was corroborated by the then Attorney General of the time in yes, court? Yes, yes. Attorney General at that time was uh, of course... Uh, Nirande. Uh, what, what, what was... what he expect... what the executive expected to him to say. But are you confident that today's judges would be stronger in defending constitutional liberties? On the whole, things have moved towards stronger democracy. But you said it in a very measured, careful way. It's not a ringing endorsement of confidence. No, no because we have seen something happen and uh, for which I have said that I have seen no regrets in quarters that ought to be sorry for it. And therefore it is that uh, I, I have used this cautious statement that I do not rule it out. What about the media? You yourself famously and correctly said that the media was asked to bend, they ended up crawling. Today the media is more outspoken, but is it more vigilant? Would it be a better guarantor of our liberties today than it was in 75? 
I would expect not only the judiciary, which has been more alert these days, but also the media and the political leadership of the country to be more uh, vigilant in respect of democratic values and civil liberties. Where do they fall short? They fall short because uh, anyone who comes to power doesn't want to lose power. And uh, just as anyone who earns money doesn't want to lose what he has earned, similarly anyone who comes to power doesn't want to lose power. And you're suggesting that the media acts as handmaidens to the powerful and the rich rather than as sentinels. In a way, yes. So your concern about the media is in a sense stronger than your concern about the judiciary? No, I have seen that from among the media, the judiciary and uh, those in authority, the biggest weakness is that the strength is that of the judiciary and the weakness that of the politicians and the media. Do you feel confident that Indian politicians are committed sufficiently to civil liberties, to freedoms, to be able to defend them? They should be much more. But I still hold that uh, the fact that we have had a successful uh, parliamentary democracy for a long time despite the cynicism of very many observers outside this in itself is uh, a source of confidence where do politicians in your eyes fall short is it in their behavior or is it that they don't take up challenges and duck them i would expect them to take up challenges and fight it out as they did during the emergency and fought against the emergency under the leadership of the Narayan. There were politicians of incredible caliber during the emergency. They went to jail for up to 21 months. Do you think that caliber of politician is missing today? I would not say that. It would, uh, it would be wrong for me to blame either the media or the politicians uh, and say it is only we have to depend entirely on the judiciary. I think that uh, all can muster courage. Let's come back to the events of 1975. Today it's widely accepted that the emergency was a way of protecting Indira Gandhi's political career after the Allahabad High Court had struck down her election and after the Supreme Court had only given a conditional stay. In your eyes, is Indra primarily responsible for the emergency or does she share responsibility A with Sanjay, her son who was encouraging her and B possibly with Siddharth Shankare who we now know was actually suggesting an emergency as early as the 8th of January 1975, roughly six months before it happened. The two dates that you have mentioned are part of the setup that uh, has been responsible for the emergency but I would uh, not like to mention any name in this manner uh, so that uh, no one can get an alibi for responsibility that it is those of who are in office. In other words, don't name other people the primary responsibility That's is right. Indira Gandhi's. That's right. So in your eyes, she is the first and the foremost guilty party. That's right. Can Congress ever be forgiven for the emergency? Can the Gandhi family ever be forgiven for the emergency? It all depends on how they themselves candidly spell out their sense of uh, responsibility and guilt for that all that has happened in these 75, 77 years. But that they haven't done as yet? Not as yet. So therefore, as of today, they cannot be forgiven. No. Indira Gandhi used to say repeatedly at the time that the emergency was necessary because the opposition had tried to paralyze the government. She kept quoting something Jayaprakash Narayan said on the 25th, 25th night 
that the armed forces and the police should not obey government orders. What did he mean? Was he actually attempting some form of rebellion or was he misconstrued? I do not think so because he always used to say that the police and the army should not obey wrong orders. He used to emphasize that and he said that that is what is expected of the police and the army. Except for the fact that he was then leaving the interpretation of what is a right order and a wrong order to the army and the That's police. Right. Is that not a dangerous a thing way, to do? In a way, in a way that, that uh, left scope for uh, Indira Gandhi and those around her to misuse that statement to justify their wrong orders. Should Jay Prakash Narayan on that night have expressed himself with greater care? I think uh, he was careful in most of the what he said. But though I was not there personally, but... Uh, you are a brilliant politician, Azwani Saab. Your words were, I think he was careful in most of what he said, which leaves room for people to say, this was one possible careless remark. Well, it's a, it's a distant uh, issue today. But uh, very often you cannot uh, pinpoint anything of that kind to justify the excesses that were committed during the emergency. Let's talk a little about your personal experience during the emergency and the time you spent in jail. As you were telling me a moment ago, on the 26th of June, you were in Bangalore, you'd gone there to attend the parliamentary committee meeting when you found out the emergency had been declared. What happened next? We got, got together, Vajpayee, myself, Shamnandan Mishra, Madhu Dindavate, to consider the developments. And we came to the conclusion that we will not avoid arrest. If the police comes, we'll uh, ask them to do their duty. We certainly asked them what is the what is the uh, what did the warrant say that wa wanted to arrest us? And when the police came, what explanation did they give for arresting you? They had no explanation except that they said that we have been asked to arrest you, and uh, so naturally we Vajpayee was not there. He had gone. To, he was had been taken to the hospital in the meanwhile. He was unwell, but we three were taken. And I, they came first to release us. And, uh, I said to my colleagues, I said they will be releasing us only to re-arrest us and try to see that the short... Can I, can I interrupt that point? In fact, when you say they released you, that is because you actually brought a case in the Karnataka High Court. Yes. In fact, you won. They released you. No, no, no. They did not release us made observations, the Chief Justice of the Karnatak High Court and the other judges, they were furious as to why these eminent members of parliament and who had come here for a parliamentary committee meeting, why they had acted in this manner. And therefore it is that they went back to Delhi and told the authorities in Delhi that the uh, warrant should be signed by someone from Delhi. Because they were worried that the comments being made by the Karnataka High Court huh. could lead to your big release. release. So they preempted an adverse judgment released to you themselves only to re-arrest you a few hours later. Yes, that's right. Uh, re-arrest re us and send us by an Air Force plane straight to Delhi and there to then to Rotak to keep us in uh, the Rotak prison. But we decided, nevertheless, to file a habeas corpus plea again in the Karnataka High Court. They had months later to bring us back again and then so finally... So right the through the period that you were arrested during the emergence, you were pursuing a case in court to the extent you could to challenge what was happening. That's right. Let's talk a little about the time in jail. You write in your autobiography, My Country, My Life, that supervision of the cooking arrangements 
fell upon Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Why did you choose Mr. Vajpayee to supervise the cooking? Because if you were to see Vajpayee's, uh, uh, Vajpayee's uh, description in the parliamentary who's who, among his lobby, uh, hobbies, the foremost is cooking. And he certainly was... And apart from that, I knew personally, because I had lived with him for uh, quite some time, and he used to tell me that you are bad today, you will eat khichdi today. I said, I will eat khichdi. So, we used to eat khichdi. What sort of cooking did he supervise? I mean, what sort of food did you have when you were in jail? All right. It was ordinary, normal food that we got. We, in fact, uh, the fact that to some extent the seniors among the, us, like Ramakrishna Hegde, they, they were permitted to get uh, food from their house also. So I picked up the habit of uh, uh, liking uh, idlis and uh, sambar and got used to it. So some people were permitted food from home, others weren't? No, those, those uh, who were uh, members of parliament, we were together one, at one place. So we all were permitted, maybe the others also were permitted. Now, you write in your autobiography that one of the characters you met in jail, a fascinating young 10-year-old boy, was a pickpocket. And he actually showed you the tricks of his trade. That was in Rotak jail. And he that actually showed you how he did it. Yes, yes, he, he showed us. And he said, what are you doing? What is the biggest thing you have done? So he heard that someone had a bell and said, what did he do? But you also taught me how to cut the jail. What? He also taught you how he does it, doesn't he? Yes, yes. 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 So in a sense, he trained you for a second profession, didn't he? <laughs> no, these were uh, side lights of our life in prison. Unlike many of the other prisoners, you actually welcomed the solitude of jail. It gave you an opportunity to catch up with your reading. Yes, that's right. And one of the books that absorbed you was William Shirer's The Rise that's and right. Fall of the Third Reich. That's you spotted right. immediately the similarities between Hitler's Germany and Indira Gandhi's emergency. What were those similarities? Similarities of this nature that you, uh, that you stressed uh, as, uh, as uh, Indira Gandhi, so many points program, so many points program, those things here also, you, we, we came to... And the other similarity is just like Hitler, Indira Gandhi used constitutional means, or rather misused constitutional means, to declare an emergency. The emergency, both here and there, technically, technically, was done constitutionally. Yes, that's right. And so that lesson was, we need to be very careful about our constitutional provisions. That's right. Mr. Dhani, let's take a break at that point. When I come back, I want to stop talking about the emergency. I want to talk instead about the elections that happened, the Janta Party government that came to power, and why it was it didn't last even three full years. That's in a moment's time. That's a very important part of our history. Make sure you're with us. To what extent was the shared experience of the emergency, and I suppose I mean the shared experience of captivity in jail, responsible for forging bonds of unity between opposition politicians which resulted in the Janta Party being formed? A very large extent. That had, uh, uh, in fact, I used to say, before the incarceration and before the, all the efforts for unity among the opposition came about, that uh, simply working together would not suffice to bring about unity of any kind. It has to be close-knit bonding in situations such as incarceration. That should be, that would be helpful to bring about real unity. So could politicians as different and diverse as Jansan, Congress, BKD and the Socialists have come together without the emergency? Or would that have been impossible? It would have been difficult. The emergency that, that way was a great boon. Now, events began to change dramatically in January 77 when Indira Gandhi suddenly took everyone by surprise and called elections. Elections weren't due. 
the parliament session had been extended twice constitutionally. Why do you think she called election suddenly? I really do not know. But later on, when I had occasion to become uh, Home Minister of the country, or even before that, when I became first INB minister, and I had uh, an interaction with uh, IB people, I said that I gather that Indira Gandhi was persuaded to call an election because your advice to her was that the opposition is now so demoralized and so disheartened that if an election is held early, you will win hands down. So I said if if this what I have heard is true, then I am grateful to you for having done a great service to the country. So in other words, Indira Gandhi was misled by the intelligence into believing she would win. It's not that she was beginning to regret the emergency and she was looking for a way out. Maybe, but I do think that uh, this had a great contribution towards the holding of elections. The elections that followed were held in the month of March 1977. Congress was wiped out in northern India. Indira Gandhi and Sanjay Gandhi lost their seats by huge margins. But in the south, Congress did remarkably well. It won 154 seats. Why do you think North India and South India voted so differently? Broadly speaking, I would think that uh, it was the misuse of power in respect of uh, uh, Nasbandi, uh, Nasbandi. Nasbandi that uh, was there very much in the north and slum not clearance as well. Slum, yes, all these things, because uh, there is no doubt that uh, abuse of power was a great factor in so far as the election results are concerned, and abuse of power relating to Nasbandi was maximum in the north. Does this also mean that the emergency impact in the South compared to the North was more benign? Abuse of power may not have been there, but uh, so far as uh, arrests are concerned, they were uh, quite, quite very much there. Now, that election of March 77 was a victory for the Janata Party. It was the first time the opposition had come to power in Delhi as the central government. And there was a lot of goodwill for that government. People hoped it would succeed. But as you know, Mr. Advani, it didn't even last three years. Why did it collapse so quickly? I would not like to speculate about that. Because it's a thing that has uh, very many dimensions. and. Three years is not, not, not a small period that way. People said that what had brought everyone together was antipathy to Indira Gandhi. But when you succeeded in defeating her, the glue that bound you loosened. No, that's not the... Uh, these analysis can be made by many people in different ways and they can find several other facets also. But on the whole, I think the fact that Indira Gandhi lost that election is one great uh, f factor that will make uh, that will be a deterrent so for those who think in terms of another emergency. Another explanation at the time it was made by your critics is that the Jansang members of the Janata Party had dual loyalties, that they were torn between the party and the RSS. Was that an unfair criticism? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. These were excuses, but uh, I had uh, I had a discussion, long discussion with uh, Vajpayee after uh, after we were together in Bangalore, and in which I said that uh, we should not be satisfied with the kind of uh, composite party that Jayaprakash ji has created 
only to fight the emergency. We should think in terms of a proper political party of the kind that was first created in 1951 in the name of the Janasangha, in which both Dr. Mukherjee and uh, the RSS were together involved. And uh, we were thinking in that direction when suddenly I got a phone call from uh, Chandrasekhar Ji, our party president of the conglomerate party, and who told me that uh, parliament is likely to be convened soon, and uh, so it would be good if we can get together at least four of us. He himself mentioned his name, and Vajpayee, and Nanaji, and myself. And I used to stay at Pandara Park, and he suggested that if we were to get together there and decide who should be our leader in the new parliament. I said, I have no objection. And I discussed it with uh, Atalji and uh, Nanaji, and we all got together. And Chandrasekharji suggested at that meeting that uh, if you were to agree, and we could have uh, Ravindra Verma as our party leader. And therefore to become Prime Minister? Of course, he was. at that time there was no question of Prime Minister, because we had been reduced to only 31 Absolutely. members. But the leader of the party, he suggested Ravindra Verma. And I reacted, I said, I do, I do not agree. I respect Ravindra Verma, I like him. But uh, I do not agree and I do not see why you have not suggested Atal Bihari Vajpayee, who is present here. So, so Charan, Charan Singh is no longer with us and uh, Jagivan Ram is no longer with us. So Only this is the issue on which actually the split happened? Yes, this is the issue on which Atalji agreed. Atalji felt that what you are saying, there is substance in it. And uh, I told, uh, okay. I told uh, Chandrasekharji, when, when I mentioned Atalji's name, Chandrasekharji says, Atalji banna chai, Atalji ban jai. So Atalji immediately said, no, you have suggested your name, I, I think that's all right. Let it remain. I'm grateful that you've clarified the issue on which the split happened because I think this is the first time audiences will understand that some of the explanations put out at the time were not right. This is the real reason. I want to end this interview by going back to something in your autobiography, My Country, My Life, which in a sense is a conclusion you draw from the emergency and it's also your tribute to the Indian people. You write, one of the greatest lessons in democracy is never underestimate the common people's political understanding or their commitment to democracy. And then you add, when it's time to defend big ideals like democracy or freedom, the multitudes rise like a mighty united force. But what you're saying is at the end of the day, it's the people of India, by the way, they voted that saved India's democracy. No doubt about it. I have uh, never had any doubts about this fact from the post-emergency events. People used to say at the time that the poor Indian voter doesn't care about habeas corpus, the constitution, freedom of expression. They only worry about roti, kapra or makan. The Indian voter showed he cares about both. Yes. Otherwise, otherwise you could not have had such a sweeping victory for us. Not one single, in several of the states in the north, not one single seat going to the Congress. What about What the about UP? All. UP and Bihar, I can see. Ah. But what about the south? That's what I said. The factors, different factors were the much less of uh, abuse of power in terms of uh, the common man. And now today when you have a few fears and apprehensions that maybe there could be an emergency again or maybe there could be attack on civil liberties, would you once again say the great Indian voter will, will defend? Will defend. And therefore there is no need for cynicism of any kind. But what you are really saying at the end of the day is that 
the best safeguard against mischief is the, the voter, the in Indian the voter. voter. Yes. And at the end of the day, if any Indian politician, whoever he may be, has delusions of power or a desire to abuse his power, remember, the voter will teach you a lesson. Right. Is that then, Advani Sahib, the real lesson of the emergency, that the Indian voter is supreme? Indira the, Gandhi was it, humiliated by the little man. It's a real lesson, not of the emergency, but of democracy in India as we have practiced it. And therefore, India is democratic because the Indian voter is democratic, yes. not because the press or politicians keep it so. Exactly. Mr. Dhani, a pleasure talking to you.